Good evening. I'm Ferry, a Master of Public Health student at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm Patricia, a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and will be your host tonight. Thank you for joining. Welcome to Pint of Science 2021 and to the Edinburgh event, News, Fake or Fact. Please share your thoughts and comments on social media and don't forget to tag Pint of Science or use the hashtag Pint21. This year's Pint of Science is brought to you in collaboration with InterSci, which is the University of Edinburgh Student Society. Please do check out our social media profiles right down below here. And since it's a Pint of Science event, I hope everyone has their favorite beverage on the ready. We should be back in the pub next year in our usual format, but this, this year, the online world has really opened up so many opportunities for global participation. And we'd love to hear where you're watching from. So please type your city and country in the comment section right below. And um, by the way, Fari, where are you joining us from? <laughs> well, I'm not in Scotland. I'm actually all the way in Zimbabwe. Technology, huh? Wow, that's awesome. So, do we have any comments coming in from people where they're watching us from? Not yet, I believe. All right. So remember, everyone, just post in the comment section right below which city or country you're watching us from. And we really like to give you a bit of a shout out. I think right. people I are shy just... today. <laughs> oh. oh! All of a sudden, it's all just appeared. <laughs> well, so far, everyone seems to be from UK. Germany! We've got someone from Germany. Oh, awesome. Cardiff. We've got uh, Berlin, as you said earlier on. Um, where else? Oh, we've got someone joining us all the way from London. Right. Newcastle, and, uh, Manchester. Ah, obviously, Edinburgh has mm -hmm. to be. I mean, it would be quite a shame if we had no one from Edinburgh, right? <laughs> oh, someone from Glasgow. Awesome. All right, let's see. Is there anyone from a really far-flung place? Like, I don't know, someone from Australia or somewhere? No. Ah, we've got someone from Italy. Nice, welcome. I would say something in Italian, but I don't know a single Italian word. <laughs> yeah, sadly, neither do I. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess uh, we'll just move on real quick. A few housekeeping things. Um, we'd like to keep this event as interactive as possible. So feel free to post any comments or questions in the comment sections right below. And there will be a bit of a question and answer session after each speaker and a discussion session right at the end after both speakers. Yeah, and you can post your questions already during the talk so that we don't have an awkward silence afterwards. Also, Abby from Pint of Science will be keeping an eye on the comment section and also moderate the chat. And at the end of the event, we'd love it if you can fill in our feedback form. The link is in, guess where? The description right below and the great news is if you fill the form in before the end of june you stand a chance of winning some pint of science merchandise <laughs> and now without further ado i would like to present our first speaker dr john rosenbach from the department of psychology at the university of cambridge we'll let him introduce himself in a second but first we'd like to play a little game he will tell you two things about himself and you'll have to guess which one is fake. To make this a little bit more interactive, please visit the website shown. So the link is also in the, is also in the YouTube chat or you can go directly to www.menti.com and enter the code 94989868 to vote for the statement which you think is fake. Over to you, John. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, there's two statements, right? Uh, yes. 
Okay, so the first one is um, I have never in my life had a tooth cavity. Mm. And the second one okay. is uh, up until embarrassingly recently, I thought that British people actually had tea for dinner. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I don't know. What do you think, Patricia? Which one do you think is fake? I think the first one is fake about the teeth. I think it's pretty rare with how much sugar we consume that we have never had a tooth cavity. Whereas, you know, people call, say, tea for dinner. So I can see where the confusion comes from. What about you, Fari? Um, well, I would say, I mean, having never been to Edinburgh or the UK, I would say definitely the tea thing doesn't make any sense. So I would say the tea statement definitely is false. But um, as you can see, we've got, wow, the voting is insane, I guess. I never expected it to be this crazy. But it seems uh, statement one is kind of in the lead at the moment. That's the one about tooth, right? That's right. Yeah, the tooth cavity. Yeah. I really hope that it's the, it has to be the T one, statement two, because I can't start off the show with a defeat. It doesn't work that <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, it seems like we're not getting that many posts coming in anymore. Uh, oh, I spoke a bit too soon. But uh, I guess... Unless something really drastic happens, I don't think it's going to change. What do you think, Patricia? No, I don't think so either. But, you know, it would show very well that fake news can sometimes look be believable. In this yeah, case. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, so, well, I guess um, statement one, the majority definitely thinks that statement one is fake. Yeah. But we are okay. getting closer. But yes, okay, we'll leave yes. it at statement one. So, John, <laughs> please tell us which one is fake, and then we'll hand over to you for your talk. Um, I have never in my life had a tooth cavity. That is true. Ah. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I, I did learn. But this is almost ten years ago that uh, British people, when they say "I'm going for tea," uh, it means they're going to have dinner. And I thought that was an extremely weird thing to say. So yeah, uh, it took me a while to figure that one out. But okay. I did figure it out about 10 years ago. So it's not that recently that I, that I learned <laughs> this fact. Uh, here we are. But still, it is confusing. Very much. For me, it is, yes. Uh, OK, but, uh, so. You live, you learn. All right. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll start my presentation. John, That's OK. Please start. Yes, are my slides on the screen? Uh, not okay. yet. Ah, there we are. OK. Um, so what happens if I click? Nothing does, I suppose. All right. Now it does, right? You can see the next slide. Great. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about learning how fake news works by making it yourself. And I thought that were, there's a, a really, really, really funny Wikipedia page that I highly recommend you visit called List of Unproven Methods Against COVID-19. Um, Meaning it would be really funny if it weren't for the fact that it's actually pretty serious what people seem to fall for these days. One of them is um, this one. This is an actual entry from that website, from that Wikipedia page. Uh, USB flash drives are being sold for $370 as a 5G bioshield so that people um, thought that, you know, they, they, they would protect them from some kind of infection, I guess. It doesn't really matter. The logic behind it isn't very sound at least not to my knowledge. But that's just a, a fool parting with his money, right? That's just someone spending an embarrassing amount of money on something that doesn't work. Okay, fair enough. But there are also other issues at play, like people drinking bleach and dying because they assume that um, drinking bleach or drinking some kind of alcohol, industrial alcohol, uh, cures COVID. And uh, a lot of people dying from that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually, uh, aside from all the funny conspiracies that people seem to fall for, there's actually a very serious component to this problem as well. So that's kind of an issue, right? Uh, it's probably something we should do something about. But it's not a really easy problem to solve because how do you prevent someone from believing something, right? That's an incredibly complicated question, even at its most simple, in its most simple form. But if you think about it, like what even are the things that we want to 
prevent people from believing or not believe because we have such a thing as freedom of expression and freedom of opinion. So uh, it's not as if we can always justify that someone should not believe something according to our framework, because if we do, who decides what that might be, right? So the way that we approach this problem is more or less the way that Professor Snape approaches the problem. If you're faced with the dark arts of disinformation or misinformation in this case, uh, your defense system must also be flexible and inventive. Right, so Professor Snape in book six, uh, just, well, uh, I'm sure you've all read it, but before the culminating events of that book, he was the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher finally, and, and this was his approach, which he thought was quite charming. Um, and the way that a psychologist builds defenses against the dark arts is through a framework called inoculation theory, which is basically the idea of uh, psychological resistance to persuasion. So how do people, how do you prevent people from being persuaded by something, right? And uh, the way that you do that is much like you would build a, um, a medical vaccination, right? A medical vaccination, at least in a traditional form, is just a weakened version of a particular virus or pathogen. and um, if you inject it into the body, the body thinks it's ill, but it's not really ill and starts generating antibodies against the illness, which protects you from future infection. So with psychological vaccines, you do kind of the same thing. So you introduce a psychological vaccine, which consists of a um, an effective basis or so a warning of an impending threat and a cognitive basis, which consists of a refutational preemption or a preemptive refutation, phrase it in both ways, of the misinformation, which through internal rehearsal generates increased resistance to future exposure against persuasion attempts. So this is how it works at the theoretical level, uh, which is very interesting uh, to read. If you're interested in reading psychological papers from the 1960s, um, I was for a little bit and then I quit, but it was good fun while it lasted. Um, but what do you use as the uh, vaccination tool, right? Well, obviously there's a, a lot of resistance currently against the COVID vaccine, the real vaccine, right? But through good communication and by making the vaccine as safe as possible and so on and so on, you can increase uptake to a degree. So it's the same with the psychological vaccine. So if you make the psychological vaccine fun, entertaining, so that people are actually interested in uh, voluntarily engaging with it, you might reach more people than if it would be something really boring or uh, something really top down, et cetera, that relies on a lot of uh, involuntary uptake. So in our case, we created games. Um, one is bad news, you see here on the left. The other is Harmony Square. And another one, which I'll discuss in a bit, where you're basically the bad guy. So you play as the editor of a news site in the case of bad news, and you're out to destroy the world. And in the case of Harmony Square, your job is to ruin the peaceful and harmonious community of Harmony Square and reduce it to rubble just by using your skills as an information agent. Um, and in so doing, you learn about the common misinformation techniques that are often used or manipulation techniques that are used in the spread of misinformation. And a lot of my research focuses on figuring out to what extent playing such a game actually makes you more resistant to future manipulation and future misinformation exposure. And it turns out that it does. Um, which I'll explain at the hand of this latest game called Go Viral, which is uh, accessible via goviralgame.com. Um, the idea here is that Go Viral simulates someone's descent into a completely crazy online echo chamber. Um, so you start out as a, an innocent social media user and you sort of get sucked into becoming an active member of an echo chamber uh, on social media, spreading misinformation about COVID. Obviously, we're uh, exaggerating for comedic effect, right? Partially because we think it would be more fun that way. And also um, you don't wanna make it too close to reality. Uh, you kind of wanna stay a little bit away from it. And um, what we did was we, uh, one of the things we did was we put a survey in the game that you can voluntarily participate in, uh, which you can see here. So uh, if you're interested, you can ask a couple of questions, you can answer a couple of questions about, um, you know, your ability to swap misinformation, basically. Um, if you say no, then you could just send to the next, uh, to, to the rest of the game. You don't have to participate, it's completely voluntary. And um, here you can see what we ask people to do. So for example, 
Here you see a tweet. This is a real tweet, by the way. We just stripped it of all the source information about this claim that a Nobel laureate had said that uh, the virus is not natural, COVID-19 is not natural, uh, and there's evidence suggesting it's man-made. This is a real tweet that went viral. Um, and what you ask people in the survey is how manipulative do you find this post on a scale from one to seven? And then what we find, this is very interesting, is here this, this graph. Um, this is that same manipulativeness scale on, uh, uh, from one, well, here says zero, but we don't actually have zero from one to seven. And um, what you find is that this dark blue bar, I think it's blue, pretty sure, or green, whatever, I'm pretty colorblind. Um, this is before people play the game, so at the beginning of the Go Viral game, and this is after they play the game, right? And here you see that there's a pretty large increase of fake news, the perceived manipulativeness of fake news after people play the game, indicated by these arrows. Right, so that's good. So that means that people think that fake news about COVID nineteen is more manipulative after they play the game. That's good. Here on the right, you have real news. So what you hope to see is that people find real news about equally manipulative after playing, because you don't want people to come become more skeptical of all information about COVID nineteen. You want them to become more skeptical of just the misleading information. Right. So these here represent real tweets containing information about how many cases there were in the UK, for example. And here you find that these this pre-post difference is mostly flat, so there's not really a difference there. So that's very much in line with our hypothesis. Uh, and as uh, we recently published last week, we had a publication out, including this study and another study, where we show that playing one of these games um, significantly improves how good people are at spotting this type of content by making it themselves in a safe um, environment such as this game. So I'm very happy to listen to and answer your questions and I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Well, thank you for this very interesting talk, John. So now is the time to please ask more questions, type it in the comments. By the way, John, so how do you reach different audiences, like people that are more more or less susceptible to fake news or maybe perhaps not interested in playing these games? Um, well, if someone's not interested, then there's not much we can do. <laughs> <laughs> so our job is obviously to make these games, uh, you know, as fun as they can be. Um, so we really tried very hard to make sure that uh, you know, it's not another one of these interventions that is created by some ivory tower academic, right? Um, it just makes it super boring and not very fun and not very engaging. Uh, so we tried not doing that and instead mm -hmm. actually, you know, having a little bit of fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the main safeguard against that. But at the same time, you have to be realistic. There's going to be a lot of people that simply are not interested in this kind of stuff, which is fine. Um, it is what it is. You cannot reach everyone. Uh, so we think it's probably very useful if other people are also um, uh, creating these types of interventions or coming up with other ideas uh, to make sure that you know we fight this problem sort of at scale uh, and not just through games, but also in other inventive ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have another question. If we inoculate people against persuasion, doesn't that go both ways? Might they also not listen to accurate sources and just maintain their previous position? Um, there is a possibility of that, uh, which is to say um, this idea of inoculation being successful relies on the assumption that people are at least partially motivated by um, accuracy to a degree, mm -hmm. right? So most people are at least in part motivated to consume and share uh, more or less accurate content with other people. What I do think is also the case is that people are not exclusively motivated by accuracy. So they're also motivated by other things such as urgency, for example, or um, partisan um, considerations. And in those cases, in the cases where other factors override accuracy concerns, then it is possible for the inoculation indeed to be less successful than you hope. But those are 
psychological factors that are incredibly difficult to overcome for any type of intervention. There's nothing you can really do about that. Again, if someone doesn't really want to uh, get inoculated, they won't be. Mm-hmm. But there, we we're, we also feel very uncomfortable with the idea of forcing people into doing pretty much anything, right? We're psychologists, mm-hmm. that's not what we do. <laughs> so um, that's a limitation, yes, that you have to be cognizant of. Okay. And how did you inter- identify the typical features of fake news in order to feed them into the game? That's a really good question. Um, so we basically did a survey of the different types of content in the, in the case of the Go Viral game that, that we knew was highly misleading and or fake. Mm-hmm. And uh, from going through that, we figured out that there were basically three very common recurring features or types of content. One being uh, content that is highly emotionally charged, right, with the intent to evoke outrage, for example, or fear, right, about the virus. Um, another one was the fake expert type content, where uh, that's one of the ones that I showed in my presentation, right, where you say this Nobel Prize winner says that COVID is man made, therefore it's a legitimate claim, right? Um, and the third one is uh, conspiracy theories, essentially. So uh, a small evil group of people is behind uh, the bad things that are happening. You don't really have to present evidence for that, but that's just how the general conspiracy theories work, right? Uh, and in the case of COVID-19, you'll say things like um, it was Bill Gates uh, that was behind it because Bill Gates makes a lot of money from vaccination programs, something, something, right? Um, so those are the three f- features of COVID-19 misinformation that we thought were uh, at least prevalent enough to warrant some kind of action. Obviously, we don't uh, cover all aspects of misinformation, but we do think that this practice of boiling it down to the ways in which people are misled, so the manipulation techniques that you're used, um, makes for a much more scalable approach to uh, inoculation and to combating misinformation than, than focusing on individual examples of misinformation. Okay. And uh, do you think satire has a play a part to play in shaping the perception of fake news? Uh, yes, I do. I'm a big fan of satire. Um, I think that these games are also, especially Harmony Square, is also very satirical in, in nature, in the sense that it seeks to mock partially, uh, but coming from a good place, right? Um, yeah. Certain aspects of politics and certain more ridiculous aspects of politics uh, that I think are incredibly important. Uh, same with uh, the use of humor, right? If you're actually genuinely funny, that lowers barriers in a way. And sometimes I feel a bit like uh, academics are allergic to this, but we don't have to be, right? Uh, not necessarily. That's true. And All right. uh, do you think um... we'll take? that one more question do you think the part of the problem is that people want to believe oh. the fake news um that i think there are some people for whom the consideration of whether something is true or false isn't uh, a major factor yeah okay. um or they might have a very different idea of what is true and what is false right mm-hmm. in the case of vaccine misinformation you see this a lot let's say right um Which also makes this topic so incredibly complex because it is true that vaccines have side effects. It's just that they are incredibly rare. But you're not technically lying if you say that you can point to this example of this one person in, I don't know, South Africa, let's say, who got a very adverse reaction from the AstraZeneca vaccine. You're not lying, but you're also not offering the context that would be required to know what the risk of that happening actually is. Right, so that makes this a hugely complicated issue um, that is not difficult, not not easy to solve uh, in a sustainable manner. Okay, interesting. Well, thank you for now for the questions. We'll have more at the end of the discussion time. I look forward to it. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, John. Um, and now I would like to introduce Introduce our second at the U. Again, we'll let her introduce off in a second. But first, same as we did before, we're going to play a little game. 
she would tell you two things about herself, and you have to guess which one is fake. And people have already started voting before I've even she's even said her statements. So just hold off on the voting, just one uh -huh. quick second, everyone. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, again, to make this a little more interactive, please visit the website shown below, www.menti.com, and enter the code 94989868 to vote for the statement which you think is fake. Or alternatively, you can just click in the link in the YouTube chat. All right, over to you, Kirsty. Hi, great to be here. Um... I have two statements. So the first one is I once had to sleep outside my caravan because I lost the keys. And the second one is I once spent the night in Edinburgh Zoo. Okay, that is difficult. I think both could actually be fake. I mean, I actually managed to lock myself out of my flat before, so I know that situation but i've also been locked in a train for several hours before which is you know a public place similar to the zoo so both sound plausible what about you what do you think fari um well so i'm guessing you're saying that the second statement about spending the night in the zoo is fake which one do you think is fake i'm not sure i would no i i would go with the camper man is fake just because it would be cooler if you, you know, spending the night in the zoo. All right. Well, last time I got it horribly wrong and you got it correct. So this time I'm just going to say whatever you say, Patricia, we're <laughs> going for the first statement. I once had to sleep outside my camper van because I lost the keys. <laughs> it's but cool. It's, okay. um, it seems it's, yeah. the audience is, uh, it seems very close. I don't know which one do you think is going to come out on top. Oh, 36. That, oh, it's same. <laughs> no idea. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. 37, 38. Eight. 37, 39. 39. Okay. Oh, this is going to be very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uh, curious well, to see what the answer is, I have to say. Yeah. I, I would say to anyone who's going for statement number two, you, you definitely got it wrong because it's obviously statement number one because Patricia got it right the first time around <laughs> and I think she already knows the answers. I don't know the answers, but I think she already knows. <laughs> no, either. <laughs> but thank you for your faith in me. <laughs> so I think it looks like the majority thinks that statement number two is fake. <laughs> Shall I reveal? So, Kirsty, yeah. could okay. you please tell us which one is fake? And then we, I guess we'll hand over. Yeah, so I have spent the night in Edinburgh Zoo. So you're, you are correct, Patricia, again. <laughs> I have not had to, ever had to sleep outside my camper van because I lost the keys. I've been unable to start a camper van because I've broken the keys and got them wet, but never had to sleep outside. How? How did you manage to sleep in Edinburgh Zoo? So it's something you can do. You, I, I used to be a brownie guide leader, so we took our brownies and we slept in the kind of community um, area. You know, they've got like a room where you can do arts and stuff and you can also spend wow. the night there. That's so yeah. cool. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it's, it's not quiet. <laughs> with all the animals, well, <laughs> but a good experience. Really, yeah, can imagine. Well, cool. I, d I definitely know what I'm going to do as soon as I land in Edinburgh. First things first, <laughs> go to the zoo, spend the night in the zoo, and then hopefully go get a caravan, camper van and try not to get locked out of the camper van. <laughs> good plan. <laughs> all right, um, over to you, Kirsty, for your talk. Fantastic. So... There are my slides. Okay, thank you to Pint of Science for having me. I'm really delighted to be, you know, in my spare room, dreaming about being in the pub with you all with a pint. Um, my name is Dr. Kirsty McIntyre, and I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Glasgow. I have a background in pregnancy and placental research, which I'm always keen to talk about. But today I'm here to talk about a project called Have You Heard? 
quite fitting that I'm here to talk about Have You Heard at a Pint of Science event because I met my fellow Have You Heard founders uh, at when we were volunteering to um, organise Pint of Science events way back in 2016. And this group of us who met through working together on several existing public engagement projects like Pint of Science, we're talking about how science is reported in the news and the importance of communicating this process with the public. And we were also aware that there were many existing projects working with young people and children, um, and we wanted to speak with and engage with adults who aren't currently involved in science, so those who might not even come to something like Pine of Science. And eventually this led to the development of this project that we call Have You Heard? And our mission is to connect with adults um, and connect them with science in a community setting, sparking discussions about what science is, how it makes it to our newspapers or to our social media newsfeed and how to interpret this information. And so to get you all, the audience, wherever you are all over the world thinking about um, about this, I'd like you to have a think and maybe you can pop this in the comments box as well about the last science news story that you heard. So what was this story about? And I would imagine that perhaps a lot of you that will be um, something to do with the ongoing pandemic, but perhaps it was an article about the climate crisis or about outer space or about a health condition. And um, I'm thinking think about where you read or heard about this. So was it on the radio? Was it shared by someone you follow on social media or was it in a newspaper? And finally, how did this affect your thoughts or behaviour? So have you made any changes based on this information or have you do you plan to do anything differently based on that? So whilst you're considering these questions, I wanted to take you on a very swift journey <laughs> um, to publication peak. So as you can see in this diagram, there are lots of steps to reach the summit of publication peak, which is where all <laughs> scientists dream of going. And each of these points represents um, a part of the journey of a research article on its way to the newspaper or, or social media feed um, where you, the audience, would see it. And so I'm just going to consider this journey in going through a few steps. Now, all good science starts with an idea, and this idea might be a new idea, but often it's based on something, some science that's um, gone before it, so building on previous research. After you've got this idea, you, your next thing would be to run some experiments. So in my case, they would be lab experiments. I would um, take this idea into the lab and run a series of experiments um, either on tissue or in cells or perhaps in uh, research animals and um, use that to test my hypothesis to see if it's true. And hopefully at the end of the same um, months or perhaps years, maybe even decades, you would then be ready to um, draft a research paper. So you would, I, you would work with your collaborators and I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to write this up with the view for this to go out into the wider research community. And the, the way that this is done, and perhaps we'll talk about this in the Q&A, the most traditional way of doing this is by going through peer review. And that really just means sending your research um, to a journal that you would like to publish it and saying, please publish this. And they will send it to um, a number of your peers who do research in a similar area and they will hopefully give you very kind, constructive uh, feedback or perhaps more likely <laughs> completely um, annihilate you and uh, yeah, be quite mean, but hopefully the former. <laughs> After that process, if that comes back and they accept your article for publication, and this is seen as perhaps a very newsworthy um, research that you've conducted, you then might want to speak with your institutional press office. So in my case, that would be the university press office. And I might have a discussion about this research, what we found in order for them to draft up a press release that would accompany the research article. So these next steps 
pretty much come in tandem, but I've put them one by one on our way to publication peak. That would be the publication of your paper, often months after you've gone through that process of peer review. And this would coincide with a press release if it's seen as being a particularly newsworthy um, piece of science. And that press release might inform any newspaper articles or um, radio parts or TV segments that you perhaps would have seen in that research that I asked you to consider before. So now we've considered the journey behind the science that you see in the news, I'm going to take a flip, uh, a look at the flip side of that. How should we read or respond to this in these articles when we see them? And what I've got here on the slide is the Have You Heard infographic, which we created in partnerships with community groups. And this infographic highlights some really key, simple, straightforward points to consider when reading science in the news. The first one, which I think is important and very straightforward, is to always read beyond the headline. So a dramatic headline does not always reflect what the research actually found. And so it's really important to just simply take a moment and to, to read that, um, that article. The second piece to consider is um, how did they find out? So thinking back to that journey to publication peak, what um, experiments, what was the process that led to this um, research being uh, in the newspaper? So in the case of health research, as I described, um, the study might have been performed on humans or animals or cells in a dish, and all of these are valid, but perhaps um, it will tell you about the relevance, how applicable that is to, to our lives. If it was done in um, cells in a dish, or perhaps if it was done in humans, was it carried out in a relevant group of people to um, whatever the study was about? The third thing to consider is this one on the right, who said so? Um, so there's a few things to think about here. Who's done the research and, and also importantly, who's funded it? Uh, was it funded by a research council or government funding? Um, or perhaps was it, as has been done, is it a cherry juice study talking about the um, how beneficial cherry juice is um, that's been funded by a cherry juice company? So <laughs> important to consider. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the research is bad, but it and could perhaps inform uh, what conclusions you draw from that. Also um, important is, are you able to access the original research? Has the newspaper article given you a link so that you can check that out if you're interested? And finally, this point at the bottom, who else agrees? Are there any quotes provided by an independent person, perhaps in the same research field, who is able to validate that research and um, and support their findings. So I'd like you to have a think about that science news story that I asked you to think about right at the beginning of my talk and perhaps you can use this infographic just now or later to apply these tips um, to the story. I'll also, this is, you can find this infographic, you don't need to memorise it now, you can find it on our website which is helpfully on the screen now and I've also got it on my final slide. So if you'd like to find out more, just to kind of conclude my talk, I've um, left some links here, which again are available on the Have You Heard website that I find are really helpful if you want to delve into this some more. The first one is under Understanding Health Research, which is an online tool that walks you through that process of appraising an original research article if you wanted to review it in depth, if it was something that was perhaps personally important to you. The second one is Ask for Evidence, which supports you in getting evidence if you see a claim made by a brand or a social media influencer that you want to see some evidence for. And they also have an understanding evidence section, which has some useful tips to consider when reading science in the news and gives perhaps some more in-depth background to what I've briefly touched on this evening. And the last one is a shameless plug for the Have You Heard um, team. We also have a podcast that the hosts Katie and Luke um, run and they have a series of episodes and in each episode they meet with an individual and they talk through um, research based on a theme. So we had a new one out today that was on dementia and previous ones have included things like artificial intelligence or graphene 
and they talk through research um, science in the news related to that theme and use the infographic to, to talk through that. So I'd encourage you all to check that out. So all that remains is to say thank you very much for your time. I'd like to just quickly acknowledge our past and present funders of the Have You Heard project. There's our website and our Twitter. Um, thank you to the Have You Heard team and also to Pint of Science for inviting me to speak. Awesome. Thank you so much for that lovely, lovely talk, uh, Kirsty. And uh, remember, everyone, just uh, post your questions in the chat um, if you have any questions for Kirsty. I don't know, Kirsty, do you want us to uh, revisit some of the um, some of the stories that people posted? Um, uh, I guess we can. Sorry. No, I was just yeah. going to say it's really interesting. It's a real range. I was just clicking through some of them now. Yeah. They're interesting. I'll have a look oh, at them later. Okay. Perhaps deal with questions first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. No problem. So this Have You Heard framework is really great. But I was wondering, do you think it's transferable to non-science related stories? Mm. Yeah, so I I think so. I think there's, um, there's always going to be things that we don't perhaps understand you know things that i don't understand about how humanities research is done or other areas so i think there's probably a lot that could be done to kind of communicate that process and um and apply these um these kind of tips or guidelines um to that i think i think it could i i just would need other people to take to you know to to adapt it and take it on and i don't see any reason why that couldn't be done if, if people are willing to do it, yeah. Yeah, I think the next time I see a Justin Bieber story, just gonna try to <laughs> apply the Have You Heard framework. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, it's it's thinking about where, I mean, and some of the things as well that John raised, you know, thinking about perhaps who who is, not necessarily the organization themselves, but can I actually validate these claims and, and what have they actually said and have they just pulled out a, jazzy headline to get clicks because you know that's what news organizations have to do these days I, I don't think we can necessarily blame them but I think it's just having an awareness of perhaps you need to um, keep in mind that that might not tell the whole story I guess that leads in perfectly with the question that we have here is there something that media organizations can do to help report responsibly on science research yeah, so there definitely are, and they're, um, what I'll refer to here is the Science Media Centre, which is a wonderful organisation that they um, link together researchers with media organisations and get those quotes that I talked about. So they have, the Science Media Centre have a kind of list of um, researchers in various topics, and if they know, because um, what I didn't have time to talk about in my talk, Often, if a big piece of research is, is coming out and it's going to go and um, be published, it'll be under embargo. So journalists will be notified ahead of its publication that that paper is going to be published. So then they'll have time to get those quotes and, and, and kind of write their story. So in that time, the Science Media Centre liaises between the media organisations and with the, the researchers and gets those quotes and, and tries to get a, a a feel for um, whether that is being done responsibly, whether it's good research or perhaps whether there might be some um, errors with that. So I think I'll try and find their website. I think it's just smc. I don't know org or code uk. So that's definitely worth checking out. Okay, and um, uh, we have this question here: Are there any mainstream news resources that are more reliable for science stories? I guess. It also leads to what John was saying about um, uh, the reliability of the source, right? Yeah, so with the Have You Heard, we try to really steer away from saying that, you know, X resource is good and X resource is bad. And I think, you know, the Daily Mail is a really good example of this because a lot of people will say, oh, you know, the Daily Mail is not very good. But I actually find that their health research and reporting is actually very you know fairly reliable they they always link to the 
the original article so you can kind of go there if you were interested in the way that some you know sometimes the BBC don't do themselves so I think I, I don't think that there's necessarily at least in the kind of general media that you should be saying this is going to be unreliable and this is going to be very reliable um, but I think it's always applying that framework of you know does the headline perhaps not tell us everything and you know all the things I talked about before yeah. So I guess it's really about applying the have you heard framework to any story, regardless of the source. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because everyone, you know, there can be some really poor articles and what you would think of, you know, people in the in the comments have, have um, talked about different resources. And I would say all of them will have at one time produced something that you might say, oh, not sure that's the whole story. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one quick question before we then open it up uh, for general Q and A. How widely is have you heard known about, and how who is your key audience for this campaign slash educational material? Yeah. So we started um, at the University of Manchester. We were a group there, so we were kind of visiting people in that vicinity, trying to get out into communities and not just focus on central um, Manchester. And recently we've been doing, obviously the last year has been more focused online and partnering with um, science festivals. We've, we've done that before and we've gone to Glasgow as well. Obviously I'm based at the University of Glasgow. We've got some people at the University of Edinburgh as well. So we're not massive and our focus has always been on kind of quality rather than quantity. We, we try to have these really um, you know, um, I don't know, I don't want to say to and fro, but, you know, these real kind of conversations between people and face to face and or online. So we're not kind of having 100 people in a room. So and there's always room to expand and to take this in. And ter certainly with the educational resources, I think, you know, there is a way of taking that framework and, and building on the other great resources and bringing that into schools, if that was something that people were interested in, but certainly not the, the focus at the moment. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so, for this. I think thanks. we'd now like to bring John back in to have a more open discussion about the talks and about fake news in general. So please remember to post your questions in the comments. So we'll start with, have you ever been fooled by fake news before? And how did you realize it was fake news? Kirsty, I guess this one goes to either one of you, John yeah. or Kirsty. So who's to go first? You can I go first know. if you want. I think, I think, I, I had, I think it's more, it's hard to recall, isn't it? But definitely, I think for me, thinking specifically about April Fools, I've that's something I can definitely recall where you read something and you go, what, really? No, and then you click on it and then you read it a bit more and then you think, ah, it's the first of April. So I think for that, yeah, definitely. But I think, again, it's kind of, you know, it's tempting if you're on Twitter or something and you read something to get sucked into it. And if you actually want to validate it, to then like actually, as I'll keep saying again and again, reading past the headline and going, ah, okay, perhaps that's not um, a true representation of what's happened. But yeah, April Fools definitely get me pretty much every year. Yes, yeah, same. And I'm the one who preaches like resistance to persuasion and I like complete sucker for April Fool's <laughs> It's embarrassing, but it will. Um, well, actually, so I have an interesting anecdote from, uh, this was last week. Um, it's not exactly falling for fake news, but kind of akin to it. I was scrolling through Reddit and I saw this uh, headline on Reddit, Reddit post that was on the front page saying something like, uh, social media usage is not re related to negative mental health outcomes. I was like, huh. Okay, interesting, because there's a really good researcher here in our department, Amy Orban, uh, and she works on this. And I was like, huh, that sounds like her research, but I've read it and she doesn't usually find that. So that's, did she find the opposite of what she usually finds? Hmm. This is a BBC article, which had as a headline, what I just said, using social media is not bad for your mental health. 
And then I read the actual article, and it turns out there was about an article, a, a, a scientific paper published by Amy Orban and a few other researchers. And the reporter that wrote this headline completely got it completely wrong, like embarrassingly wrong. So what they found in this study was the link between social media use and mental health is not stronger now than it was 10 years ago. So the link, the strength of the association has stayed the same, more or less. But that doesn't mean that the association doesn't exist or doesn't exist anymore, right? So this headline writer had just completely missed that. And they thought that the headline was, or that the research was about um, social media use not being linked to mental health at all. Bizarre. And I was like, wait, that's great. But I had to like really like scroll down and pretty much read all the way through this BBC article to find out they'd gotten it wrong. And that's all. And the, the only reason I picked up on that was because I know the researcher who did this. And it's like, that doesn't sound like her work, right? Which is a complete coincidence. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah, it just shows how uh, difficult this kind of stuff can be. Yeah, very true. I guess uh, if I had read that, I most probably would have been like, oh, that's interesting. And they most probably gone and told everyone else without knowing yeah. that they just kind of totally wrong. But yeah. I'm wondering if uh, we, we can get a few more questions and maybe we can bring up some of the interesting questions we had earlier on. But, uh, okay, so here we have a really lovely question which says, any chance we'll see a collaboration uh, looking at inoculation against fake news, uh, fake science news, that is, and do you think that there would be differences between this and inoculation against other fake news? Um, really good question. That's already sort of happening. Um, so there's a great uh, researcher. He's now at Monash University in Sydney in Australia. Uh, his name is John Cook. And you might know him from Skeptical Science. Is this big blog about climate science and climate science misinformation. And he created this game recently called Cranky Uncle. Uh, which you can download. It's in the App Store and in the Google Store, I think, uh, for free. Uh, which is basically about this. It's also like a technique-based or logic-based inoculation, but against uh, climate science misinformation or climate misinformation. And uh, the goal of the game is to uh, make your cranky uncle who doesn't believe any science as cranky as humanly possible by pissing him off with uh, you know, facts and, and logic about the climate. Um, which is hilarious, and and John is a is a cartoonist uh, originally, and also a physicist, and he became a psychologist later in his life, uh, and he created this game, and it's it's really fun, and it works extremely well, but it's based on the same principle, right? And the principle is, uh, what's the logic, the method sort of behind the manipulation, and if you can expose that, then people become more tuned to it. So this works more or less in the same way. It's just that the techniques themselves are slightly different when it comes to climate misinformation than it comes when it comes to COVID misinformation, for example. Uh, and what do you think about the way forward? Is it making scientists better communicators or making journalists have a better understanding of science? Maybe, Kirst, do you start? Yeah, I think, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I know that's a bit of a rubbish answer but I think it's that as well as having I think for from what we've done with have you heard the public having a better understanding of kind of the process and what's got to that stage and who you know who's had a say in what gets to the newspaper I think is important and um, yeah I think it's I think it a lot is to be said for making science accessible and I think that's perhaps what John's doing with you know making it fun and interesting and kind of jovial but also communicating the science in a way that is accessible to the public. So, you know, writing a, a summary, an abstract that can be accessed by someone who perhaps is living with a health condition that you are doing research on, I think is really helpful and, and doesn't, you know, doesn't need to be really, really hard and, and that science doesn't need to be inaccessible. But equally, you know, I've always re already referenced the Science Media Centre, but the work that they're doing to kind of really provide context to what the research is and um, is important too. Um, at, a, at a personal level, I think there's a lot of value to learning to communicate your research as a scientist to people who aren't scientists. Uh, by which I mean, 
for me, it even helps me at a personal level better understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Because if I only use the very theoretical concepts, then maybe I'm just missing something, right? And I'm convinced that the stuff that I work on isn't so complicated that you cannot explain it to someone who doesn't have a PhD in statistics, you know? So uh, I, I, I try that quite a lot, actually, to learn how to, how to talk about my work in such a way that, um, you know, my brother, for example, who is, I think is very smart, but he's not a scientist. Uh, he's like, oh, yeah, hey, that's cool. That's interesting. I can see what you're talking about. Um, yeah, there's a lot of value in that as for, in terms of personal development for me as well and for the quality of, of the work that I do, for sure. Well, unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time. I know, right? It is a bit sad. But uh, we'll take one more question, um, if we can pop one question on the screen. Thank you very much. It says, with the advances in machine learning pattern recognition, oh, this is getting a bit uh, technical. Do you think, do you see it as potentially being a useful tool in tagging probabilities of fake news on articles? Um, I guess uh, we'll go. I, I've got first. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, nah, kind of, but I'm not enthusiastic about it. Um, they make a lot of mistakes, I think, especially because uh, fake news isn't the only, um, like fake versus real is not the only dimension that we're worried about, right? We're also worried about misleading versus not misleading or manipulative versus not manipulative. Because if, uh, again, if I say, if I post something about like, uh, this person got a uh, heavy reaction from the COVID vaccine, I'm not, I'm kind of spreading misinformation because I'm leaving out the fact that this is a one in 10 or 20 million chance, right? But I'm not lying. So in to what extent could a, an algorithm or machine learning uh, neural network, let's say, pick up on that? I, I find it very difficult. I, I haven't seen it done in such a way that it's usually reliable and immediately useful for implementation on social media. But it could be useful, I think, as a tool for human uh, moderators, let's say, who want to make their own jobs a lot easier. Yeah, for sure in that way, yes. But as a direct implementation on, on social media feeds, not yet. And I'm skeptical of it being, uh, if, if you can make these things good enough, even at a theoretical level, that they could be implemented in such a way. Um, Kirsty, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think that's a very valid point. I, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Context is everything. And, and you know, you need to provide context to order to understand the whole truth, I think. Yeah. Right. So I guess that's all we have for our Pint of Science event today. That leads me to thank our speakers, Dr. John Rosenberg and uh, Dr. Kirsty McIntyre. <laughs> and thank you also to the wonderful Edinburgh Paint of Science team 2021. So in no particular order, we've got Athena and Maria, the Edinburgh coordinators, Christina and Natalia, the event managers, Faiz, the master of comments, and Abby, the YouTube moderator. And thank you all for tuning in participating and asking really insightful questions which stimulated some interesting discussions. Don't forget to fill in that feedback form so you stand a chance of winning some awesome Pint of Science merchandise. Good night. And until next year. Bye. <laughs>